Um, so yes, the, the link to the Jamboard is in the chat uh, function already. If you'd like to have a look, uh, you can, by the way, feed into that uh, later uh, in the day or, or tomorrow. We're going to leave this live for a little while. So, uh, but, but it's a way for us to capture things live, uh, which is really helpful. So uh, first of all, thank you very much to everyone uh, who's joined us this evening. Uh, very impressive turnout for a six o'clock meeting. Um, and especially, as I say, it's said on such a warm uh, and hot day. Uh, so thank you. And thank you to all the speakers as well. Uh, we've got a really good lineup of speakers with us tonight. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to go through uh, four speakers, Nadia Smith, and we'll introduce them as we go along. Toby Costin, Afshin Rashid, and uh, Mark Lundley. Um, we're going to try to do so five, 10 minutes per speaker maximum. So it's just sort of to give them their experience of scaling up community energy uh, different uh, from very different angles, actually. And then really much opening it up to Q&A. So what we'll do, we try to keep the main Q&A for uh, straight after the four speakers. Although we do have, uh, we're going to allow five or ten minutes after Toby, sort of halfway through uh, the the speakers, so that um, we can sort of try to to get some comments and impression uh, after the first two speakers. Sometimes it's, it's a bit long to wait till the end of all four speakers. Um, but that said, to keep the conversation really alive, let's uh, let's try to wait if we can to the end. In the meantime, you can capture your thought in the Jamboard. Uh, but also start putting question, comments, thought in the chat. And um, as uh, said, uh, Kerry will be keeping an eye on the chat, so making sure nothing gets lost along the way. Um, and when we come to the Q and A, if you'd like to uh, actually sort of, you know, talk about your your question rather than just typing it, that's absolutely fine. Uh, you're welcome to come uh, uh, live, you know, and on camera if you want to sort of raise your question. So. Um, Without further ado, I guess, um, Sahid, do you want to add anything maybe from uh, Community Energy London before I'll talk about Community Energy, um, uh, the, the Community Energy Fund? Yes, that's great. So th thanks, Sylvia. So once again, to some of the latecomers, my name's Saeed Ahmed, the Chair of Community Energy London. Uh, we wanted to particularly host this meeting because uh, the Community Energy London, if you don't know us, we've been operating for over about three and a half years in the capital. We started as a loose collection of organisations in around about 2016. And effectively, what we wanted to do in the first instance was to try and find a route to support groups for feasibility financing. Uh, because if you remember at the time, there was a government instrument called the Urban Community Energy Fund, and the government withdrew that funding for groups, even though only a small proportion of the overall spend was actually dispersed at the time. Uh, working with Sylvia, colleagues, and the mayor and the deputy mayor for energy and environment, we were successful in securing £400,000, which paid for precise, precisely the element uh, where groups struggle with in terms of originating projects, which is feasibility funding. Uh, we're very happy to say that money uh, was uh, drawn down quite quickly as groups came forward with some excellent projects and um, that eventually went to £500,000. But from our perspective, a key thing that members constantly say is they want to scale up. They want to deliver more projects, they want to deliver bigger projects and they importantly want to utilise more technologies and get the participation of more Londoners in those projects. This, from my perspective, is critical in the climate change agenda because we will never achieve the goals that the government want on net zero without public participation. We have to uh, install thousands of EV charging, uh, infrastructure bits of equipment, heat pumps, heat networks, insulate homes. These are all large scale programs delivered at the local level and we need community groups to act as an interface between businesses and local authorities to really get these projects moving at scale. So uh, we've got four excellent speakers today that we wanted to address. Nadia will be talking about some of the experience that her organisation, South East London Community Energy, have been working on developing solar and reflect on what are some of the levers that we need to pull to get solar actually installed at uh, a much more ambitious level in the capital. Uh, we're very pleased to have Toby Costin from Crew, who will be talking about, well, community energy is more than just solar. And there are a number of new opportunities, especially on heat and energy efficiency. And Toby will run through some of the really innovative work that crew are doing there. Uh, the element I mentioned, which is absolutely critical, how do we ensure that we have a just transition within including more people within the actual community energy sector? Repowering have been particularly good 
at trying to involve all sectors of their community across a range of projects that have been developing in South and West London. And we're very pleased to have Afshin Rashid talk about that as well. And finally, the money. Where will the money come? We're very pleased to have Mark Luntley from Rescoop, the European Trade Association for Community Energy Groups, to talk about some of his experience working with local authorities in terms of identifying funds for community energy, as well as perhaps some kind of opportunities that have been realised on the continent. Uh, that's all I'll say for the moment, apart from just to thank our speakers again. Again, we'll be opening up to Q&A afterwards, and we're really, really keen to get people's thoughts on all of this. Sylvia, over to you. So my name is Sylvia Baron. I work for the Greater London Authority, the GLA, uh, and I manage the London Community Energy Fund, amongst other programmes. Uh, and with me, I've got um, Emma Gray, who's uh, with us tonight as well, sort of in the background doing lots of things um, for this, this event. And also Kerry, who is in our policy team and leads sort of on, um, again, various energy and climate change topics, but including community energy. Um, so thank you to them as well for helping today. Um, I just wanted, to, I've just got one slide, but I think I just wanted to tell you a little bit more about what the mayor has been doing to support community energy. It's fair to say that the mayor really sees community energy as part of the solution to decarbonizing London. Um, as you probably all will know, uh, Sadiq Khan's got an ambition to make London a complete zero carbon city and, uh, you know, is throwing everything at it, really, uh, including community energy. And he's been a, a great supporter of uh, local based action for all the various reasons, including obviously saving carbon, but also all the core benefits that community energy brings uh, to, to our great city. Um, and so in, in, in quick summary, you know, th this was a, a scheme that was launched in 2017. Um, and initially it was quite a, a sort of a smallish pot of money looking to support community groups. And it has sort of grown uh, thanks to its success to half a million pound in total now, um, and there's sort of three different phases. What we've done is support community group in the early stage of a project development. So this is not sort of capital funding because when we started, there was still a feed-in tariff, for example. Um, but but to help with the sort of the, the, the at-risk elements of projects, you know, the early feasibility studies, the the the, the drawing of of legal agreements, etc. So uh, we helped uh, all together so far uh, 48 projects in London. Uh, that goes across sort of about 80 buildings that have benefited from this uh, fund. And uh, once it's all actually uh, into sort of um, deployment and installation, we expect uh, to have generated up to five megawatt peak of solar. Uh, th this scheme, by the way, is not just about solar. Uh, all the pictures are solar, but that's sort of easier usually to take a, a photo of. Um, but also energy efficiency. We've got some uh, anaerobic digestion. Uh, we, we, we've got sort of electric vehicle charging point, battery storage, etc. So, uh, and, and altogether, they're hoping to save about uh, 1,500 tons of carbon per year. So, you know, a great success uh, as far as, as we're concerned and uh, many, many projects. There, there's more on the website and I, I will put a link to this uh, right at the end. So, you know, we're very supportive uh, at, uh, at the GLA and, and this is one of the reasons we're doing this event as well. We want to see what we can do next. So, you know, a scheme like the London Community Energy Fund is great and we, we would uh, hope to be able to continue. What else can we do to really scale up now? And, and understanding that the challenges are quite different in an urban setting than in a rural setting, for example. You know, when I think about rural setting, I might think, you know, if you scale up, you simply make uh, maybe a, a solar farm, you know, qu something quite large in terms of scale. Uh, similarly, you could start looking at um, wind turbines. These are the sort of things we probably can't do in, in such an urban, uh, densely populated environment like London. So really interested about how we could scale this up. Um, so I'm going to stop there and now sort of really uh, pass over to our uh, main speakers. So Nadia, if I could start with you and you're happy to share, um, to, to, to drive the slides, aren't you? So I'm going to stop sharing. There we go. Can everyone see my slides? We can't hear you very well, Nadia. Can you see the slides now? Is that better? So we can see the slides, but the sound is really low. Okay. 
Let me move my laptop a bit closer. Is that any better? Yes. There we go. Well, thank you very much, Sylvia uh, and Seed, for the introduction. Um, so, Southeast London Community Energy, I wanted to talk about scaling up uh, solar, but also the other aspects of our work, including the fuel poverty uh, alleviation work uh, and how we've managed to do that. But first, I would um, like to present a bit of a question for you. Are we able to do uh, polls? I think, uh, Emma, you're organising polls. Yes, I am on that right now. Wonderful. So the first question that I wanted to ask our attendees is how, how many years do you think that Celsi has been going? Um, do you think it's been six years, eight years or uh, 12 years? I think Emma will put the poll up for you and um, we'll see what people's views are. So. As you can see from the picture, South East London Community Energy has reached kind of a diverse range of people um, and we've got two core or two or three core areas of work, depending on how you look at it. Uh, one of them is uh, renewable energy generation. The other is energy efficiency and the third one is fuel poverty alleviation. So really working to match those different aspects up. Will we manage to get the poll online, uh, Emma? Yes, we have the poll in the chat box. Oh, wonderful. Let's see. I don't think I can view the chat box. So if you could let us know what the results are, that would be great. Oh, uh, we only have two responses at the moment. Um, oh, it looks like someone said they're not able to vote. That should be possible. I'm getting a message unable to reach application or words to that effect. No worries at all. Uh, so we'll uh, we'll leave that question and Emma can try and sort it out while I crack on else we'll uh, <laughs> I'll be talking for longer than 10 minutes and I'll get told off uh, by the team. But uh, first, but the answer to the first question was Celsius has actually only been around six years, which is not a lot um, in terms of a normal social enterprise. But in terms of community energy enterprises, it's a decent amount of time. Um, in those six years, what we have done is we've brought together a group of skilled uh, Greenwich and Lewisham residents, and we all have a vision for a low carbon future where everyone can access affordable energy um, that can meet their needs, and everyone has a voice in how they can, uh, how that energy is produced. Um, so, so far we've got around 14 solar sites across Greenwich and Lewisham. Those are a mix of schools, community centres, um, and churches and uh, sort of, uh, uh, what's it called? The word's gone out of my head, like swimming pools and um, places for recreation. Uh, that's over 7,000 volunteering hours that have gone into this work. Uh, and every winter we run something called an energy cafe and we run our fuel poverty alleviation work. And just last winter, we managed to give advice to over 280 residents. Um, we held 35 workshops on energy saving tips um, and we had 20 training sessions for our frontline workers. Um, and that's over 200 attendees, frontline workers being trained on how they can go and help people out of fuel poverty as well. And I think uh, our CEO Giovanna, I know sis has joined, uh, joined the call just now. So Giovanna, if you spot anything I've missed, uh, do feel free to jump in there. So scaling up solar, um, we have gone from doing our first share offer to our second share offer and most recently run our third share offer, which was just before the end of the feed-in tariff. Um, we've installed solar on schools leisure centres, which is the word I was forgetting, and community hubs. And we've worked with local councils at Lewisham and Greenwich to um, access these schools and access the sites and to support the work. Um, we've had a few grant funded projects as well. Uh, one of them most recently, which uh, I've been working on, is through the Lewisham Community Energy Fund, and that is a solar site that is going to be installed after the closure of the feed-in tariff. So that's not reliant uh, on the government subsidy. So these are really sites um, that wouldn't have been sort of economically viable uh, without, 
without that support. Um, what we've done to scale up that solar is we've partnered with uh, local organisations, both climate change based organisations and environmental organisations and other organisations outside of that. So people we've engaged with include Climate Action Lewisham. Um, we did a little kind of stunt with Climate Action Lewisham about air quality. Um, we've engaged with XR and we present at some of their events. We've got one coming up next month um, if you're interested to attend. Uh, we've partnered with Clean Air for Catbird and also universities. Uh, so we've got a little project called the Solar Roller, which is essentially um, that can be used for, um, for fairs and for events outside. Uh, that we kind of rent out. Um, but it was, uh, I believe, the University of Southwark have been involved in that and a few other or local organisations. And that's aside from partnering with uh, other community energy enterprises that we do work with. Um, when it comes to our fuel poverty alleviation work, again, there's a number of uh, local partners, um, but we've all also kind of tried to diversify our projects to really reach the people that are hard to reach. And how have we done this? We've thought about the hard to reach and we have considered the steps that we need to take to get to them. And that doesn't necessarily involve going out and speaking to them ourselves. So our Empowering Elders project uh, actually trained elderly people in fuel poverty alleviation in giving out energy advice and they then went on to be kind of pioneers of, uh, of fuel poverty alleviation and actually train or give advice to their neighbours, to their friends who might have been afraid to leave the house or people that are not, uh, are not ready to talk to a third party about their, um, about their energy bills, about energy debt, things that can tend to be very sensitive. Um, we did the same thing with parent power, uh, which was uh, using one of the schools uh, that we had uh, engaged with previously. One of the parents there was, um, was amazing and they took on learning how to become an energy advisor and became qualified uh, in that. And then we also trained other parents on how to do that themselves. Um, and they went out and gave advice to people that they had access to in their local community. So one of the things that has been really key for us in this work uh, is working with community partners. Um, in the fuel poverty work, one of our main community partners is Charlton Athletic Community Trust. That is a community trust that's been set up by the football, um, football team, Charlton Athletic. And they really have um, access to a lot of people that would need the support um, and they support us in managing the system of getting referrals for people that need fuel poverty uh, advice or energy efficiency advice um, and they support us with the funding of that. Yeah there's a delay it's like it's like there's a tape loop. Sorry? I'll I'll, um, I'll keep going, but if there is any issues, just drop me a text on my phone. That would be easiest. Nadia, I'll just interrupt for a second. Sure. Alban, hello, Alban Thurston. Would you mind turning your camera and sound off, please, during the presentation? Thank you. Thank you. We'll go outside. <laughs> um, so our next uh, project, which is the ECO project, um, and ECO comes from the term energy company obligation, it is a project that is supported by um, Lewisham Council, I believe, and they manage the uh, ECO flex declarations uh, and the funding that goes to that. Um, so the ECO project is something that we set up in partnership with Lewisham Council and in partnership with uh, installers, energy efficiency installers, where we can interview people and we can support them to find out what, um, what energy efficiency measures they can really have installed in their own homes. And we've been able to install those energy efficiency measures in a large number of people, people's homes uh, through that funding that has come from energy companies. 
Um, so again, working with the local authorities on this is key. Um, I'll say that community energy is local, so you really need to reach out to the organisations that are local to you. Uh, again, through our training programmes, we've actually managed to establish a bit of a local hub for ourselves uh, through training those frontline workers. Um, I think I had another question here, but I can't quite remember. Are we able to set up the polls? Yes, yes. Question is coming right now. Um, oh. There we go. It was around um, other people that have worked in community energy projects. Have you worked with local partners on many of your projects? Is that right? Hopefully you should be able to see it in the chat. Yes, and people can answer just by typing A, B, C or D in the chat if they will. That's probably better than the pool, which doesn't seem to work for uh, a lot of people. No problem. So it's just something to get people thinking. Um, and I, it would be interesting for me to find out how many community energy enterprises have found more success with projects that have local partners and um, things like that. So uh, we'll have a look at that uh, after I finish the presentation, because I think I may be running over a little bit. Um, but one of the other aspects that has really helped us scale up is innovations in what we offer as services. Um, so many community energy enterprises across the UK are struggling with the old revenue streams that they had becoming less reliable, whether that is removal of the feed-in tariff subsidy or whether that is um, the increase in the restrictiveness of eligibility for fuel poverty support um, through eco funding and e eco flex requirements. Um, so how have, we, how have we responded to this? Well, one of the things that we've done is try to be more agile, more, more agile and make our services very much more reactive. So when the coronavirus pandemic hit, we very suddenly had to turn around and end all of our energy cafes in person um, and we've actually managed to provide that service online throughout the pandemic now. So we're doing it over video calls and telephone calls, and we've partnered with um, councils and people that are providing the local food packages to add our leaflets into those. Um, so that has managed to support a lot of people, and it was something our team had to do super quickly um, and be very agile and reactive to, uh, to manage. Another aspect is diversifying the kind of services that we provide. Uh, so Future Fit Homes is a project uh, on energy efficiency that targets the able to pay market. So it's homeowners, individuals that want to invest in their home a little bit and make it a bit more, um, a bit more easy on, uh, on the environment and also save themselves money on their energy bills in the long run. Um, so that service is us providing a report uh, going around and uh, giving one-to-one um, -one advice on what people can do to improve their energy efficiency, the energy efficiency of their home. And then also we can actually link them to vetted contractors who can do those installations. Uh, another project, uh, LED in the Way, which is funded um, in part by the uh, Lewisham Community Energy Fund and the London Community Energy Fund uh, is um, we're actually learning from crew uh, on this because they've been working on LED lighting for a while uh, and also SC24 um, are our partners in this but we are looking at installing LED lighting in community centres in buildings which perhaps would have benefited from solar while it was under the feed-in tariff, uh, but it's not necessarily completely economically viable to do now. We're installing LED lighting in them, making sure they do get a reduction in their energy costs until it's more viable to do the solar in the future. Um, so that's kind of a bridge that we've put in place uh, for ourselves until the cost of solar come down and the cost of battery storage come down as well. And then another aspect is kind of strengthening and growing the partnerships that we have. 
uh, and diversifying our partnerships again. So a new one that we will be launching very soon is a partnership with the co-op community energy where people can actually switch their energy supply at home uh, to a tariff that is fully powered by community groups uh, around the UK, uh, which is amazing and it's great to work with another cooperative as well. Um, and then we're also inputting our feedback and our comments into our local authorities climate emergency plans, which is very crucial and it's a it's a really good step uh, for us to be able to engage with them on that. Um, and then the last thing that I think really makes a difference to whether community energy enterprises are able to scale up uh, quickly is the policy landscape that we're dealing with. Um, so nationally, we know that there's a strong interest in community energy. We know that it features in uh, in policy saying that is it's favorable and it's definitely a good thing to do and it is a government priority. Um, the GLA launched the London Community Energy Fund, which has been extremely helpful uh, for getting new projects off the ground. Um, but on a local level, there is not so much uh, support and there's not the granular support that community energy enterprises really need, in my view. Um, so we are very glad that Lewisham have launched a community energy fund uh, themselves. Um, and they've also recently published their climate action plan Greenwich, um, our other borough, are also developing their climate action plan as well, and we're inputting into that. Um, so what can community energy enterprises do uh, to to engage with their um, to, to change policy, to develop policy to support us? Well, the first thing I would say is get involved in your um, local climate change citizens assembly if there is one make sure people are aware about community energy who are involved in general climate change movements engage with your local councillors your councillors will be interested to come to your events your councillors will be interested to hear about what you've been doing so talk to them um, not just over email speak to them in person on the phone again same with your MP know your MP well make sure your MP is showcasing what your organization is doing in the local borough um, and uh, when you complete your annual review do it in a format that relates to the targets of the local authority so it is clear um, how you've been meeting their targets and in a lot of cases you know going over what their targets are um, and send it to them make sure they've seen your um, your annual review and make sure they see it every year and see how you're growing every year. In terms of actions for local authorities as well, um, I think it's it's really crucial that local authorities understand the strengths of community energy enterprises and where community energy can actually reduce the burden on local authorities uh, departments that are dealing with you know fuel poverty or that are dealing with climate change. There are a lot of things that community energy enterprises are already well placed to Tottenham do. Until I die, which, as you can see from this face, might not be too long. Sorry, I sorry. Didn't hear that. Alvin, so Preston, I, I think you still got your microphone on. Sorry, Nadia. No problem, no problem. Um, the second thing that local authorities can do is make sure that they've got a community energy officer, an individual that is. Uh, responsible for engaging with the community energy enterprises within that borough. Um, it's worked very well in uh, in Plymouth, uh, where Plymouth City Council actually appointed an officer that works part time in the council and part time uh, in the community energy enterprise, and they've been able to get loads of stuff done with their community energy community energy enterprise. Um, You've got about then, it, uh, Nadia. Sorry to interrupt. Almost done. So the last thing is to seek to engage community energy enterprises in any policies that you develop as a local authority and any consultations that you put out. Um, community energy enterprises, we are really strapped for time and a lot of us are, um, are working on a volunteer basis. So it might be a bit of a scrabble for us to notice that this policy um, consultation has come out or that one's come out and there's lots for us to keep our eye on. So if you're at a local authority and you're developing a policy consultation that might involve um, CEEs, make sure you contact them and make sure that they've seen it and you've had their input.
um, I think that is it from me. Thank you very much for listening and uh, I'll pass back to Seed. Cheers, Nadia. Thank you very much for that. A number of really interesting points uh, towards the end of well about uh, community energy, sorry, climate emergency plans. So just to remind our audience, 28 out of 33 London local boroughs have pledged a climate emergency declaration. Uh, I will we'll return to this issue about what CEL is doing around that. Nadia, please stay online because we're going to have a short Q&A after Toby. I'll stop talking. Toby, are you with us? Yes, I am. I'll hand over to you, mate. Thank you. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. All good. Grand. So uh, now I need to work out how to move my slides. Brilliant. Uh, great. So, uh, hi everybody. Uh, I'm Toby from Crew Energy. We're South West London based. We're particularly focused on Wandsworth and Merton. Um, and on this first slide, there's a bit of a timeline of, of, of what we've done so far. So, I think the sort of the, the, the main message that I'm delivering today is there is life beyond solar. Uh, and we started with life beyond solar with our first project being an LED lighting project um, back in 2017. And then I think our next project didn't involve uh, so either that was uh, building management systems LED lighting a youth centre uh, on Lavender Hill and it wasn't until two years later actually that we did our first uh, project which was last year that had solar PV and storage in it and, and there was two projects there we had three projects in that year that were part of the Islington Com Community Energy Fund so um, so it took us a while to get around doing our first solar and, and now we're moving on so 2020 we've just been awarded a grant from Power to Change for their next gen fund and next gen is all about the next generation of community models so we've done solar pv on schools and and on uh, uh civic centers so what's next and and i've got a couple of slides on those kind of projects and what people are doing to talk about now uh, so there's been 11 uh, groups through next gen over the last two years there was five in the first phase and there's six of us chosen in the second phase and this is just the whole melding of, of all of them so some of these were phase one some were phase two and what you'll notice is that only two of the projects uh, are solar pv based so uh, gloucester energy and lock Lees. um We've got a couple of renewable heats, Green Fox and ourselves. There's Green Homes, so that's really sort of new build and looking at how you can upgrade buildings to carbon neutral. There's EV ownership and EV charging. So NADRA have taken the extra step and they're looking to own their own cars and have a, a small fleet of, of electric cars. Flexibility is what Bath and West are looking at. They're part of our round. Um, and then there's LED lighting in schools, I think, with Chester. And then a really interesting project from Carbon Co-op in Manchester, they're looking at data and how data can be used to offer a better service for community energy groups. So, you know, a really wide range. And it's fascinating how cutting edge a lot of this technology is um, and, and the developments we're looking to achieve. So, um, so it's not just about solar. Uh, we've talked about LED lighting and, and Nadia mentioned her presentation that we've kind of partnered up with them and SE24 to try and help them get to the, the next phase of doing one of those projects. Why LEDs? They're, they're probably the most like solar PV out of all, all the technologies really. It's pretty easy to understand. Uh, the savings are good. So you save around about 59% compared with traditional lighting. Uh, you reduce O&M costs. Uh, reason being that they last for 30 to 50,000 hours. Traditional bulbs might last one to 10,000 hours, maybe. Um, so greatly reduced costs. So they're, they're nice projects to understand. You've got to sort of get to grips with maybe about 10 different types of lighting and you can do most buildings and you can go and audit them. You can you can find out. We, we, we're happy to post uh, information on this, but you can find out what, what the old bulb was worth, what the new bulbs will be worth, and then you can make, make your calculations and kind of work out what savings might be. Uh, we've put building management systems in, and essentially they're, they're zoned heating controllers. They can do other things, but really primarily what they're looking at is they have sensors outside the building, sensors inside the building. They're measuring how long it might take through their algorithms on how quickly you can heat a building. Um, and then say, right, one room is needed at 10 o'clock. That needs to be heated today from 8.30 to get to that temperature because it's really cold outside. But what you're doing is 
you're taking away that binary the heating's on the heating's off you can heat floors you can heat rooms you can heat specific parts of building um and typically that will save you around about 25 percent on your heating bill so it's a really nice measure and and you've got the ability to tag in other monitoring as well so things like co2 so we're looking at a project at the moment back at, at the doddington roller which was our first project and that's essentially underground they have a, a handling system and we can measure the carbon dioxide in each of the units at that site to make sure that the air handling comes on when the, the CO2 levels are rising. But it means it doesn't have to be on permanently. They can kind of phase in and phase out that, that air handling system. Uh, you can measure moisture. So if you're talking about social housing, you can make sure that damp isn't building up and therefore creating mold issues and those kind of things. So it's re they're really clever and smart systems. Obviously, the biggest problem probably uh, that, that Britain faces is insulation, uh, mainly because it's incredibly expensive and paybacks are very, very long. So it's kind of hard for us as community groups to get too involved. There are quick wins like loft insulation. A lot of that has obviously been done through eco and, and warmer homes, but there's probably still a market there to, 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 to find and, and develop. Uh, I think solid walls are a whole lot harder, a whole lot more expensive, but there are innovations on the way. And we're working with one innovation at the moment but a lot of these products need approval by BBA and BRE, and that's often quite challenging. Um, we're also working with a product that's a heat transfer solution, which is called Hydromix, and it's had trials across the world. It, it, in America, it's got lead points, lead a, bit, a little bit like uh, Briam here in the UK, and it gets 10 points. And essentially, it replaces water and glycol in heating systems or cooling systems, so closed loop systems. And it's a nice, simple one to understand again. You know, it, it will roughly save 25% on, on people's bills. You just got to flush the system out, pump this stuff in, and that's pretty much it. So most, most of your local plumbers will be able to handle this. They don't need special skills to do it. So it's a nice product to be able to market when you're looking, say, a whole building or a whole house solution. Um, so that whole holistic approach to, to managing a building and what can be done there. Um, part of our funding with uh, NextGen is uh, energy assessments. So we will get to train two people up to be domestic energy assessors and one to be a non-domestic energy assessor. And what we're looking at there is, can we make that another, another source of income? Because I think if we're all going to be sustainable and resilient going forward, we're going to need multiple incomes. We can't just wait on one project at a time. We're going to have to develop lots of different models, lots of different products and money will trickle in from each of those streams. And, and we think that, that the energy assessments will be, be a pretty big thing uh, over the next five, 10 years. There's going to be a whole lot of buildings that are going to be need, need assessing to work out you know, what needs to be done with them to hit 2030 targets for the councils and 2050 targets or earlier for, for the rest of the boroughs. Uh, and, and we think that's an interesting area. And then just looking at some of the projects that I'm seeing on NextGen, and we had a really interesting call on EV charging this week. So we're trying to have Zoom calls once a month where we all discuss various projects and kind of learn from them. And, and this week it was Brighton Energy Cooperative. And it was all about how they're going to install 10 points at uh, Brighton Uni um, and they got further planned. And, and it went into fantastic detail on you know, the, the size of it. Should it be a, a, a seven kilowatt system? Should it be 22s? Why should it be seven rather than 22s? Who are the best providers of, of the charge points? And there's a whole lot of learning there. And I think, you know, part of how we need to develop is, is sharing that knowledge between us and finding a, a platform where we can share all that knowledge. Um, NADA community, as I said, have gone a step further. They're looking at car clubs. So they're actually going to develop a car club. But they don't think without the funding from NextGen, this will succeed on its own. What they, they're discussing now is actually forming a whole network of community groups that, that buy cars together, share the software platform to drive down costs. And I think it's a really interesting model. And I think maybe more of those co-ops of co-ops may be what we need to succeed and to grow. Another interesting area, uh, and there was a project, I think, uh, both these projects are in phase two, uh, Plymouth Energy and Burnside. They're looking at working with um, uh, developers on new build and then upscaling those new builds to be uh, zero carbon. Uh, so really interesting to see how they're going to do that, because obviously a lot of the value of installing, say, a higher quality heat pump or 
uh, solar PV is benefit down the line. It doesn't benefit the developer, it benefits the resident. So it's how they're gonna claim that extra money back over time to make this model work. And it'd be interesting to see how they develop that. And then flexibility services, I think are gonna be a really interesting area for us as groups and, and how to develop the behind the meter stuff. So not just make great big battery storage things by wind farms or by solar farms, but what can be done locally to support local DNO really. And uh, uh, Bath and West have, have partnered with uh, STEMI Energy from Spain and they're offering behind the meter solutions. Uh, um, and initially phase one is gonna be on shifting the hot water tank um, to different times a day and then getting paid for that, that, that flexibility to be able to decide when you heat your water. So really interesting stuff and a whole range there, you know, there's a lot of technologies going on that, that you, can, you can pick up and adapt. And I'll just talk very quickly about our project with NextGen. So we're looking at installing heat pumps and we're looking at, at, at three areas really. One is heat pumps to a civic center or commercial building. Uh, and we've got a couple of those in the pipeline. One's uh, the VAS Club that we've worked with before, which is a youth center. And the second one is the Polka Theater, which is a children's theater in Wimbledon. Uh, and we're looking at how we can develop heat pumps into those two sites. We're also looking at heat pumps into blocks of flats, and there's a couple of options there. That could be a shared ground array, or it could be uh, what they call a dual, dual loop system uh, into those flats. Uh, so we're trying to identify blocks at the moment, and we've partnered up with uh, Power Up North London, so they're looking at projects in Islington, we're looking at projects in Wandsworth and possibly Merton, and we'll see where we get to between us on, on who finds a project that, that, that can fly in the next sort of year, really. Uh, and then the final part is heat pumps to domestic clients. And, and that's difficult in London. You know, you've got to be a, a metre away from a boundary wall um, either side. Uh, and our houses are probably four or five metres wide. So that means pretty much sticking a one metre long heat pump slap bang in the middle of your front yard or your back garden. Uh, so we're looking at technologies, new technologies that can hide the outdoor component of, of a heat pump. Uh, and see how that would work and, and see how the economics of that would work as well. The good thing about domestics is the RHI has been extended for two years, uh, for another year, sorry. So we've got two years left rather than one year, which means there is time to sort of start building a model to that. And equally, the, uh, the white paper that's come out uh, or the uh, consultation that's come out for the white paper is suggesting a £4,000 uh, down payment. Uh, which would help. You know, it, it, it's on the way. It probably needs to be a bit bigger to make it viable, but it's it's on the way, and it, do, it does mean the government aren't going to just drop heat once RHI is gone. Within our projects, we've got a couple of innovations. Uh, one is heat shifting to optimise pricing and CO2 emissions. If you can shift to overnights, quite often that's very low carbon because it's all wind rather than four to seven. And obviously there's there's a whole pricing differential there. So we're doing some work on that. We've got some interesting models. We're very happy to share with people if they would like more info. Uh, and the second part is heat metering. So if we're doing blocks of, blocks of flats, we have a big credit risk on charging residents for heat. So what we're gonna have to do is heat meter them have those heat meters to prepay and they will prepay for their heat but it should still be cheaper because let's say their heat might come out of 4p if they were on an economy 7 previously they might be paying 12 to 14p typically that also means that if we need the economics to justify it we can charge them a bit more on the heat metering to make the economics work so they might end up paying 6p rather than 12p uh, but it means that we therefore can make the project work and heat metering will be key to working with residents in blocks of flats and potentially with domestic households as well where they're being financed third party. So uh, that's a really important part of our project. Thanks, Toby. I think that was your last slide, if I'm correct. I got one more, I got one more. So I just want to say one thing. Uh, We've, we've been doing our, uh, writing our first share offer uh, this last six, eight weeks, and the support from all the groups in London has been brilliant, and also best go down on the South Coast. Provided us with, everyone's given us all their, their, their previous decks and lots of advice and lots of tips who to speak to, and it's been incredibly brilliant, and I've jumped two slides, sorry. Uh, so what I would say is please don't be afraid to ask for help. It's a great community. I'm finding this again with the Next Gen team and projects. There's a whole bunch of people there that really, really want to help. So just ask. You know, my contact details are on the slide here. So if you've got any questions about our staff, you want us to send information as we do each phase of our project, more than happy to send out our reports to you. Cheers, Toby. 
Uh, we'll take a, a quick break uh, rather than run through the whole four presentations. So are there any immediate questions or clarifications around Nadia or Toby's presentation? Emma, was there anything uh, particularly, there's a, a couple of things in the chat column, but uh, Nadia's done a good job at um, answering as well. But have I missed anything, Emma? Uh, there are no hands raised, but in terms of questions, I think Kerry has been having a look. Um, lots of good answers from Nadia. Uh, I don't think we've missed anything. Good. So one of the questions I raised, Nadia, which you've uh, answered is about in terms of scaling up the appetite for Londoners to want to invest in solar. And you've quite clearly said that the investors aren't the issue, it's the sites. Can you just elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, so we ran our last share offer um, last year, running up to Christmas. I think we closed it in early January. And um, what we saw was about 30 just over 30% of the people who had previously invested in us were investing more money in us. Um, and the rest of it was new investors. And a lot of these people were um, ready to come to events that we'd held, even though it was almost Christmas and everyone was busy getting ready for Christmas. Um, people were really keen to be engaged and involved. And I think on a wider scale, we are starting to see a big shift to movements towards green investment. Um, and it's some it's a trend that's kind of being set by the big investors, the big corporations. Uh, but it's also coming up from a grassroots level. People want to invest green. They don't think that fossil fuels are, you know, the way forward and profitable anymore. And they want to invest green and local. Um, but I would say it's definitely finding the sites that are economically viable for us to install, especially solar on. Um, in some cases, we've had to do a larger site, uh, which one of them was um, the Intercontinental Hotel in Greenwich, and it's supported us be, being able to do the smaller sites that probably otherwise wouldn't have been able to go ahead. Um, that's brilliant. So just refresh my memory, on the Inter Intercontinental Hotel, your, your scheme is developed or developing? Um, no, so we've installed now and it's uh, it's all finished. And that, that's a leasehold with the hotel? Uh, yes, so it's a, a normal, we are renting the space from the roof through a roof lease and we're selling power to the hotel and then the hotel are giving power to a community art installation which is being developed right next to the hotel, um, which is a tidal powered moon clock. Wow, okay, that's uh, a whole presentation in of <laughs> itself. Toby, I'll just take Chairman's privilege and just ask you, I mean, the government's original uh, projections for use of heat pumps was something like 12 million. They've, uh, they've scaled that down over the decade. But do you know what the size of the prize is in the areas that you're working in, in terms of the utilisation of uh, a migration away from gas fired heating to heat pumps? I think there's, there's quite a big debate at the moment whether it's going to be I think, say, six months ago, more people think it was going to be purely heat pumps. There's going to be 27 million heat pumps in 27 million homes. I think as as the grid decarbonizes at the rate it is, I think more people are now thinking it could be heat panels. So, you know, one to one heating. But the, the problem there is it is one to one. Uh, so whereas we're getting heat pumps now up to 400 percent. And if you look at this dual loop concept, so that's essentially having maybe in a block of flats, an air source heat pump outside that just heats the water 20 degrees, then you're taking a really warm feed into what might be like a Kenza shoebox style uh, ground source heat pump in the flats, you might get up to 600% efficiency. So when we're talking about a massively constrained grid, you know, one-to-one -one heating isn't going to be the answer. So they're going to have to do something about this. And I think it's, 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 it's really for the uh, heat pump manufacturers to come up with solutions that work in cities like London. You know, we cannot have a one meter massive great box outside a house that's banging out 50 decibels. There are solutions, you know, there's a, there's a very expensive heat pump on the market, but it's only 29 decibels. That is whisper quiet. You would not hear that thing in, in a London background. So it, it's finding those and the developers are coming. Uh, Dakin have come up with a very interesting sort of dual loop system for individual homes that I think could be the solution for what we're looking at. So 
it, it really is finding the right product. But, but, but the, obviously the key thing here is getting rid of gas, you know, for so many reasons. Gas, because it's, it's three and a half times dirty in the current grid if you had a heat pump. If you're on a green tariff, obviously it's infinitely worse. But it's also about um, particulate matter, carbon monoxide, um, uh, uh, NOx emissions, all those things that are coming out of your gas flue as well. So remember in city centres, gas flue emissions are the third biggest polluter after transport and energy. So um, so it's key that we get rid of gas boilers as soon as possible. And yeah, heat pumps are tough at the moment. They're, they're expensive. Thankfully, we've got the feeding tariff, uh, sorry, the RHR for another couple of years. But what happens? I, I don't think four thousand pounds, for instance, is going to be enough. You know, heat pumps will cost twelve to fifteen thousand to install. So four's kind of you know a bit of a slap in the face. But I guess it's an opening gambit because it is their consultation paper. Okay, and uh, I can see that Cara has uh, raised a question about the clean heat incentive. Uh, there's a couple of questions coming through now. Forgive me, uh, questioners, if you wouldn't mind maybe copying and pasting your text for the Q and A session after our next two speakers. Otherwise, we will be uh, running late. I'm notoriously bad at chairing. So I think, uh, Nadia, Toby, thank you for the moment. We'll come back to a plenary Q&A very shortly. But can I bring on uh, Afshin Rashid to talk about the key element of community energy use about people? Afshin, over to you. You're on mute, I'm afraid, young lady. Uh, there you go. <laughs> thank you, Saeed. I'm just going to bring up my slide there. Just bear with me a minute. And need to put that in. Okay. Just want to put that in my slideshow view. Okay. Sorry, can I can people see the see my screen? All good, Nafshin. Great, thank you. Fantastic. So thanks, uh, Saeed. Um so some of you would ha have already heard some of what I'm going to say at the Community Energy England conference. So apologies for a bit of repetition, but uh, I've been uh, invited to focus more on the participation, inclusion and just transition um, side of our work. And great to hear about what uh, Nadia and Toby have shared on, on the developments on solar and the new technology and diversification. Um, I don't know about the others, but from our experience, it's been a, a race really to get projects in uh, established and we really haven't had the time to kind of reflect and think. Um, so I actually am quite pleased now that with the feed and tariff deadlines, we're finally putting our hair of, uh, head above and we can think forward uh, and plan and in a way kind of consolidate and, and build a strengthen our foundation. So our focus um, for those of you uh, who aren't familiar with repairing, actually, we are a Brixton-based group. We started off in Brixton. Our first schemes were in Brixton. We were the first on uh, social housing in a, in a city context. We were the first in London. And I think we, we kind of broke the mold from, from the typical community energy is for, uh, you know, it, for the rural areas, for the typical people that you would see um, engaging on environmental issues uh, and the climate change movement. And we really brought in a very uh, diverse community uh, into, um, into community energy and establishing the first Brixton Energy Co-op. And that's been our foundation. And those are the principles that we are driving forward, really, is, is how, how, do we, how do we include people who wouldn't have already engaged? So while solar is our vehicle, as you can see from many of the projects, you know, largely uh, our projects have been moved up solar uh, so far. It's also been um, our work has been around young people, empowering uh, volunteers and enabling other community groups to do the same. So we're kind of forming a family of corps within within London, be it the Brixton Energy Scheme, the Vauxhall Scheme uh, and, and our initial schemes I've just highlighted, the Brixton Energy and Vauxhall, were all focused on, and Bannister, were all focused on social housing estates. So really micro-local and, and um, you know, in areas of high deprivation, areas that are generally very challenging, even from a development point of view, to get um, site access and, and reduce costs. Uh, more recent uh, co-ops that we've established, like Lambert Community Solar and not Kensington Community Energy, are, are borough-wide um, co-ops that are looking at bringing a wider group of people and bringing a, a bigger portfolio of projects. This is largely driven by the project economics, obviously with the reduction and now removal of the feed-in tariff, the economics works better to have that scale. Um, 
And so we are focusing right now on building our community, really uh, strengthening those bonds and connections with those uh, volunteers and local residents in those areas. We're also looking at how do we how do we achieve scale? And as you can see, uh, you know, our kilowatts installed uh, a, a very, very uh, modest there, 670 kilowatts. But it's spread across several, several buildings, you know, because it's social housing. Bannister House, for instance, is on 14 blocks. Um, so just to give a, um, a, an example, and our latest scheme, which is on the leisure centre, which will be our largest, which is 138 kilowatts, which will be uh, going in um, hopefully in July because we, we had to halt after the shutdown. So the, it's it's very, the, the portfolio is really diverse in, in terms of size uh, and, and scope. So we, we're looking at how can we how can we operationalize and make it a cookie cutter model that we can share better with community groups where existing uh, established groups don't exist or where there are community groups wanting to do it but don't know how to find their way. Um, and the other piece that we're working on is building our partnerships with, uh, with uh, corporate partners or uh, technology partners to develop our innovation projects. So I'll touch very briefly on that, but the focus really of my slides here today uh, about the community side and the people side, as sides mentioned. Um, so our, as I mentioned, all of our co-ops have their individual volunteers. And when we start off, it's really about, as Nadia has mentioned, really working closely with existing anchor local organizations. So for instance, when we were uh, initially talking to community groups and residents in North Kensington, then it was linking up with the organizations like Migrant Organized, Westway, Tr Westway Trust, the Dolgano Center, which are real strong community anchors and hooks, uh, but also making sure that we are being in inclusive in allowing people and volunteers to get involved and participate. So we spend many uh, late nights <laughs> in meetings, talking to people in, in, in community spaces, and I'm sure a lot of community energy groups kind of uh, will, um, will, will know and share the same stories. Um, and it's difficult when uh, when you're part of supporting many community groups ac across London, because then one one night you're in East London, um, and and then the other you're in West London, <laughs> uh, hidden in a in a little cub or a community centre having a meeting. But what is great about this is the volunteers, and I, I would say we're definitely seeing a large number of volunteers come forward because of the uh, you know the huge kind of. Um, uh, your appetite to address climate change, the emergencies that are being declared by local authorities, to really see an opportunity. And they're also, I've seen the shift from, from that kind of global perspective of, you know, climate change, something far out there, nothing that I can do about it, to real local action. And I think community energy beautifully links the two in terms of really um, empowering people, because a lot of people have been quite disempowered and not knowing what they need to do, a bit overwhelmed as well initially uh, with all the messaging coming through and community energy uh, offers something positive and something practical, something local. Uh, and I know, uh, you know, community energy is often cr criticized for just being solar only and it, it, we aren't solar only, but solar is a great hook, I must say, in terms of getting people involved because when you see your estate where nothing is happening, and all of a sudden you see those solar panels on that roof and you made it happen. It's a real tangible um, benefit that is creating that carbon reduction. So that community sense of pride is absolutely important and an important role that community energy plays. Um, and uh, with our volunteers, a lot of our work is as repairing is about supporting and mentoring them. And I'm really pleased to say that uh, Today, uh, I'm not able to join that uh, AGM, so we've got another AGM with our Lambeth Community Solar Scheme, and three of our volunteers are stepping forward as directors to take uh, you know, that role, that important role of leadership and that role of decision making, and it's, it's a great journey to see. Um, and some of the other work that we're doing as well is you know, not just about energy, talking to communities about energy, but we are uniquely placed, again, to make those connections with other uh, themes around a low carbon lifestyle. So if you see the photo um, at the bottom there, it, it, you know, on the, on the bottom left co corner, you, oops, uh, you know, we, we're running events where we're encouraging other kind of groups, local groups to come together, where we were doing gardening, you know, encouraging people to pot some plants, you know, looking at fixing your bikes, to having workshops, so really connecting those themes uh, across, so it's not just about energy. So again, 
uh, an important role for community to really connect people, inspire that local action and sharing knowledge. What I want to really showcase um, and highlight here today is um, about our community champions. And it, it's a wonderful journey to see. Uh, one of our, um, one, of, one of the local residents we, who we provided support to on, uh, you know, saving money on their energy bills and um, it, it, tackling a particular debt issue on their bill. Um, she, she was so inspired by the support that she got. She wanted to get involved in other ways. And so she then helped uh, she came and attended a few of our focus groups to shape our innovation projects. Building off that, uh, she's now our paid community champion in the Brixton area. And she's been a strong advocate, reaching out to all the community groups in that local area, really spreading the word around uh, the support that we provide in terms of uh, energy advice and saving money on their bills. But what we found during the coronavirus, and similar to what Nadia was saying, uh, how community groups are able to really pivot and, and really uh, pull together essential resources and support. Uh, and this is only possible because we're so locally rooted. And in our case, uh, Fran, you know, who is our champion, she played an extremely essential role in really shaping out uh, those local connections and making sure that people weren't left uh, without the essential support they needed. And um, we, we did the same in terms of getting our flyers into uh, commu community food parcels that were being distributed in, in the local area. And we linked with the, with Lambeth Council at the time. And, and rightly so, Lambeth, uh, you know, and many councils were focused on uh, food provision and shelter, um, whereas, you know, energy was being was being dropped and lost in that in that discussion. We were able to come in and really make sure that these essential uh, support services were promoted. So I'm really proud with uh, proud of Fran's journey. And, uh, you know, ho hope, hope she can come in and talk about her work uh, that she's doing right now in some future cell event. Because she's doing some real digging, detailed digging into, um, you know, research uh, on a lot of the suppliers uh, support of, uh, of uh, you know, of peak hours support services and on peak hours support, support services so that we can really target our support for local residents. And similarly, we're looking at not just uh, uh, energy, we're looking at how we can provide additional uh, referrals and support beyond energy. So there is water, there's um, the financial uh, support and debt advice. So there's lots of links, again, uh, to wider community benefit and, and impact um, that is coming through this champion model. I, you're not only shaping our community support services, but community champions have also been absolutely vital in our innovation trials. And here I'd like to share the story of another uh, resident, um, you know, who got involved in the Brixton Energy Schemes back in the day in 2011-2012 and uh, was a university at the time, came to our meetings, was involved and interested, is one of our members in our schemes. And to see the journey where he, he's joined us as a community champion to start with and uh, quite played a, a very essential role in engaging with residents uh, at our Brixton Energy site where we are. Um, trialing a local electricity supply uh, scheme called Community. It's being uh, led by EDF uh, and uh, UCLR research partners as well. UK Power Networks uh, have recently joined, uh, providing um, a certain flexibility side to the project. Um, so it, that that resident now, he, not only did he come as a champion and support um, the engagement with the residents in that block, he. He's also now moving forward, you know, he's no longer a community champion and instead he's one of our lead uh, mem uh, team leaders in, in one of our um, programs. So I think those are really great stories to share and I really feel proud about that journey because, uh, you know, the, the jobs, the employment, the skills, the work experience, the opportunities that community energy brings through its projects is really, really significant. And I think we've, 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 we're doing it all the time, but probably don't shout out about it as much. And if we if we aren't doing it, then I would really encourage people to a try and and and, and create these work experience, you know, uh, within within their projects, you know, with local within local people. Um, but also, um, if you are doing it, then then do shout out more about it. And I was really pleased to see the Community Energy England report that was uh, recently launched, and and there are hundreds of jobs being created through Community Energy. Um, so there, you know, there is definitely. Uh, a very positive um, impact economically as well as social that we provide within these uh, regions. 
I'd like to also just share a little bit about the innovation trial, because I think we've had a bit of a journey here. Nadia was talking about solar and other projects around energy efficiency. Toby's highlighted the range of uh, the, uh, technical uh, solutions that community energy are, are working on. And one of our schemes, that I've, I've got this slide here, is about that behind the meter solutions and that microgrid where the energy that's being generated uh, locally, that is owned locally, can be consumed locally. And the reason why we're doing it as uh, Brixton Energy and Repower, and the reason why we're in this game, because it is really, really challenging uh, developing these models, um, is because our sites and our journey has been on social housing. And we've been deeply frustrated by the fact that we've got these solar panels on the roofs, but the people living in the blocks can't really benefit directly. Schemes either. So, so you know, how our, our position is, how can we make this green revolution? How can we make these community energy business models as inclusive where people who can't afford their homes and why, you know, and people can't afford their money to invest in this green technology can benefit from a reduced uh, cost on their energy bills, thanks to schemes like this, and also for the uh, generation projects to also benefit. And what uh, we've seen here, again, I would ha highlight that partnership with EDF was absolutely essential in uh, working through a lot of the detail uh, around the regulations, around the legalities, around the metering and the billing, um, and getting that um, approval through uh, the Optum sandbox uh, exercise, which allows them to develop uh, and allows us to develop uh, this scheme. And we are now seeing a few benefits, and you know, the four households uh, that are part of this trial are already seeing benefits in their energy uh, bills, and they're seeing credits on their accounts. And what I like about uh, this particular model and scheme is that uh, uh, it is applicable to both uh, prepayment meters and credit meters because, uh, you know, that's uh, often a barrier. And we have a lot of prepayment meters, particularly in London, on these social housing blocks. So really great to see those benefits come through. Uh, again, there's still more detail to be worked through. And we're working with UK Power Networks on flexibility services as well. So there will be a battery included within the, within the project. And uh, so we can maximize the usage by the residents uh, during the daytime and, and, and nighttime in terms of solar usage. And so they can see more savings potentially on their bills. But also we're going to be looking at what are the, uh, you know, what are the benefits and other uh, services that can uh, emerge through these flexibility I'll one minute, please, I'm afraid. All right, OK. <laughs> uh, I, find, uh, I think this is my second last slide, so I'm going to be really brief. I think most of you would have heard about me talking about our engagement with young people and that uh, uh, training program, which is uh, a, an AQA accredited one. Uh, we found that's fantastic for engaging primary school, uh, sorry, secondary school um, children, because, young people, because they're of that age where they're looking for that uh, experience. Whereas with the primary schools, we're now developing a theatre project, uh, which is, again, linking climate change and connecting, um, you know, their curriculum with what we're trying to do in terms of uh, energy uh, generation and energy savings. A final slide, which I'm going to leave you with, is around the governance. And I, one of the things that we are developing, again, building on that inclusive model of participation, and we're all very familiar with you know, the core principles of, of community energy projects and, and adhere to that community ownership control, control and benefit. And really proud about that one member, one vote. So no matter how much you invest, you have the same say. Uh, but we are often talking about investor members and uh, a lot of our, pro our recent uh, projects and uh, schemes, societies, they are community benefit societies. And people who don't have money to invest can still join. Uh, the, uh, the, the the project, you know, they can join the society through a one member, um, um, you know, a, a small nominal fee and, uh, and, and, and have equal decision making and a stay in the project. And this, I, I think there are, there will obviously be mixed views within the sector itself around this approach. But this is something that we are championing, particularly in our North Kensington scheme, where there is a lot of people uh, where they just don't have the money uh, to invest in and I think that's represented a lot of the communities that we work in and um, and we shouldn't really be promoting in investments for people who, who aren't able to eat or eat and and this is a real uh, model of allowing that participation and, and inclusion so I'm just going to leave on that uh, and I hopefully have covered everything that I wanted to say thank you cheers Afshin that's really great uh, I think what we'll do is again we'll save 
questions to the Q&A plenary after our final presentation from Mark Blunkley. Mark uh, is here representing Redscoop, the Renewable uh, Community Energy Cooperative Organization, uh, and he'll be talking about some of the roots of financing uh, community energy, particularly in an urban context. Uh, just to preface that, I just noticed today, Mark, that uh, Sizewall has finally put in its uh, planning application, and it's good to see they're only asking for a £20 billion subsody for uh, or a cost associated with Sizewell. So it's good to see that even nuclear, after so many years, wants a big chunk of money. And on that yes. note, I'll pass it over to you, Mark. Thank you. OK. Can everybody hear me OK, by the way? You're all good. So. Yeah. Good. OK. Uh, I wanted to talk about um, financing of community energy. And it's interesting, really interesting hearing some of the previous talks. I My career was in local government finance. In fact, it started in Greenwich and Lewisham. So I was uh, at the time that Greenwich Le Leisure was created. But if we can just go to the next slide, please. I wanted it. So I'm involved and I'm on the board of uh, Rescue. But I represent, uh, but the, the group that's there is Energy for All. Now, I thought I'd start just by talking a little bit about Energy for All and why it is different and has cooperation at its heart. If you look on the left there, you'll see this map and obviously wind in the north, solar in the south. West Mill grew, uh, and um, Energy for All grew out of Bay Wind, which was a single um, wind project in Barrow in Furness. And from that, you can see there are now 27 projects and there are wind, solar, hydro, community heat. There's a development project. Some of them are in rural areas, but increasingly in Edinburgh, Reading, the schools co-op I'll talk about in a bit, a joint venture with Marks and Spencers. And it's a model that works on the basis of cooperation. So we work with a community to develop a project. Uh, we raise the funds, if you look at the second chart there, we build the project, we support that community group, and then that community group becomes an owner of Energy for All. So it's a sort of a, a circle. And over the last, uh, last um, years, until last year, we'd raised about 71 million pounds in shares and loans. We have 13, our co-ops collectively have 13,000 members between them. And that's supported by a small team in Barrow in Furness. But one of the other things I'd just say is, we have a pay ratio from top to bottom of three. And, uh, you know, so there's, it's, it's about our values as how we work as an organisation. So that's a little bit about what we do and how we run. Could I have the next slide, please? So it's a pause when you wait till the slide comes. So I thought I'd talk um, uh, about finance from local people. And here are two examples. Not all of these are energy for co-ops as I go through. In fact, you'll find that they are different. The one on the left is that's Edinburgh co-op. It was a really long procurement process, but you know, effectively the council decided it was going to work with a community. And the council identifies the sites and these are schools and their community centers, they're visible sites so that people say, oh, there's panels. How does that work? So, you know, they're, they're incredibly are open for, for people to see. There are 24 sites. We raised 1.4 million pounds uh, in a series of share offers on a one, one person, one vote. It generates about 1.1 gigawatt hours a year. And the surpluses are used to support community projects in the area. And we've had a series of share offers and we keep building more sites. Site on the right, some of you might have seen, is not an energy for all project, but it was when we built it and I was on the board, am on the board, was the largest community solar project in the world when it's built. It's built for £15 million. And just to take uh, science point, the site down the road was built three years later and cost £4 million. And if you were to build it now, it would probably cost two. So, you know, the collapsing costs of renewables. Uh, that was interesting. That was funded by local people, but also a local government pension fund, because this is a long term project and pension funds look for long term investments. Um, 
that project has had 14,000 visitors over it and it now has virtual tours. It gives 65,000 in community benefit and it's looking at a series of other partnerships now to increase its community uh, and community engagement. So, you know, pension fund is one route to support projects. Could I have the next slide? So this is actually something is about why cooperative finance? Why not just you know, put the money in from central government? I think there are a number of reasons why community owned energy is really different. Co-op Energy a few years ago looked at uh, acceptance of community energy and particularly wind farms. And there's a lot of support for it. But that support really jumps if it's actually owned by local people. So it's part of being a, you know, renewable energy being actually accepted by people. And it is a, uh, for, for councils as place shapers, you know, the money is raised in the area and it stays in the area because the surpluses go back to members. And if the members buy their electricity, there's even more of a circle. So it's the idea of moving from the eye. So if you think about the work that Preston's been doing, looking at models where money stays in the area, different models, I see this as part of that. Um, I think that it crucially transforms people from passive consumers into active energy citizens. So raising the money is one thing, but actually how it, it makes people different, differently involved. And the idea of control, if you have 10 million pounds and many projects are owned by high net worth individuals, you control it. If you have 100 pounds, if you have 10 pounds, the sort of people that Afshin was talking about, you don't. Well, cooperative models allow people to have control. And bluntly, they cut out the intermediaries. So when you put your money in the bank, you get half a percent. And when it's lent out to somebody else, it's lent out for an awful lot more. Well, cooperatives have the ability to collapse that that chain and, and put people directly in control. And finally, and we've just seen it today, co-ops and community groups are innovative. Could I have the next slide, please? And I thought I'd show four projects in different countries and different technologies. Um, the first one is, uh, it's not a picture of a technology, but that is the schools co-op. It won innovative co-op of the year. 79 schools, two point, nearly 2.9 megawatts of output. Uh, they've raised another near on 700,000 pounds for another 21 sites, including Salisbury Cathedral. So it's the idea of here, you know, working with groups, including I think Ealing and Harrow in London to put solar panels on schools. I think this LED lighting has also been put in some of those schools. And that is also an education resource. So you can build in the schools and actually show children what is climate change, but also what are different forms of ownership. This, the one, the second picture on the top right is the Oxford Bus Company, and that's part of Low Carbon Hub. I can see people here from Low Carbon Hub, 140 kilowatt system. And it's interesting how, again, it has influenced things. So that the the finance director of the Oxford Bus Company sits on a low carbon hub, as does the Oxford City and Oxford County Council have representatives. The, low, the bus company has cut its energy use, its driver energy use by over 20%. So by getting involved, it's done a series of other things. Um, it's got low energy buses. And it's just made up, it's just, you can see it's rippled into other things. The bottom left hand one is uh, two local authorities in France in a place called BC, and they are working with uh, two groups, Enercop and Energie Partagée. Energie Partagée is the developer, Enercop sells electricity uh, around France and is a network of 24 energy co-ops. And they're building a five megawatt site with, um, with uh, uh, local members but also with uh, uh, the ethical bank Triodos. But the councils will step in afterwards and will um, buy a share of that and will lend money. So it's quite a low risk thing. So again, the council's finding ways of supporting projects in their areas. 
And the final one is, um, I'm a member of it and used to live just near it, is Osney Hydro. So it's another low carbon hub scheme. And it really grew out of people whose houses were flooded and, and, and said, well, what are we going to do about the climate emergency? And the local council, Oxford City, supported the low carbon hub. They gave it a loan. And then the low carbon hub was able to build things get a bit of a track record and went out and did share offers and replaced the loan. So the local authority was actually practically supporting um, the project. So there's support there in terms of uh, finance. There've also been practical support in terms of uh, access to sites and, and, and so forth. Uh, can I have the, fi the next slide, please? So what I'm talking about is a model. So if, if you have the left-hand side, and this is a slide from our European friends. Um, the model guess, uh, um, from the 1980s is centralised. It has centralised funding and it has centralised generation. And it's a pretty dumb system. The system of, if you says tomorrow, it's actually increasingly the system of today is decentralised. And it doesn't make sense to have a decentralised system using centralised finance. And so what you end up with, if you have decentralized finance, you have that model on the right. Instead of having big energy and customers as the, as the subject, you end up with citizens working together and controlling the energy system. Could I have my final slide? So I've talked about money and, you know, I was a finance director, so I'm interested in money, but actually this is a group of people who are creating um, the European uh, Collective Cooperative Investment Fund called MISIS, mobilizing European uh, citizens to invest in sustainable energy. It's a fund that's bringing together um, five co-ops and we are trying and working with Greenpeace Energy and with other developers. And the hope is in the next period, we'll be able to offer a fund for co-ops to scale up community energy. But I thought I'd show this picture because if you look at the people there, there are French, British, Belgian, Spanish, Estonian, American, Dutch, German people from different community energy groups. But that photo is taken on the border of um, Belgium and Germany. And 70 years ago, people of that same age were fighting and killing each other and now they work together and for me it's about money and it's about community energy and the climate transition but it's also about citizens working together creating a different sort of way of working thank you oops sorry there mark thank you very much that's the last of our speakers and uh true to form i've um run us over time a little bit but i've had a word with sylvia and um she's happy to continue to host us for about another 10 minutes or so i can see that the chat column has been very active throughout the discussion uh which has been very very uh, uh encouraging to see emma how have we been doing on the jam board let me hi hello let me have a look at the jam board Yeah, we've got quite a good number of post-its on our front page. Um, well, if people want to continue hosting th uh, posting things on there, that would be good. Um, Mark, uh, Afshin, Toby and Nadia, can you, if you want to, turn in your cameras or so. And I'll, have we got, Emma, any immediate um, comments? But just to start things off, Mark, can I ask you one thing? The London Pension Fund Authority came out with a report this week about their climate related investments, projects that they were actively looking to do. Uh, there are some big schemes I can see in the past that they've um, invested in wind, large scale wind. They've invested in biomethane to grid, larger projects. Uh, those projects by their necessity have not been in London. Should we be encouraging some of those local pension funds to invest locally particularly with an eye on community energy? Uh, I think that, I think it's really important that councils work 
with uh, cooperatives, because this is more than just a sort of climate emergency. It's also about citizen emergency, as I was saying. I don't think that it's been terribly helpful because over the last two or three years, the 89 local government pension schemes have been collapsed into six pension pools. I think that there is a, a very, and what is effectively emerging are a group of intermediaries, private equity intermediaries, who are saying, we will box together half a dozen different projects uh, to make them large enough so that the pension fund can invest, because the sort of due diligence is sort of the same, whether you do a big project or a small project. So I suppose, thinking off the top of my head and not speaking for any organisation, uh, I think there's a model where actually it should be different community energy groups around the UK come together and say, rather than deal with somebody and then deal with us, and that's somebody in the middle takes out a lot of the funds, uh, it, we should find a model where those funds invest through uh, um, a group of co uh, cooperatives. Thanks, Mark. Um, have we got, Emma, any immediate me uh, uh, people asking questions? If not, I'm, I, can, uh, I can see that uh, we have a guest, uh, Phyllis, who's talked about the fact that she couldn't install solar on her property in Camden as they would not permit it because she lived in a conservation area. I do know, Phyllis, that elsewhere in the borough, in Dartmouth Park, residents actually got together with the council to issue a special planning notice such that they could look to explore sustainable energy measures within the conservation area uh, in terms of uh, properties of that type in the area. So, Afshin, just in terms of planning and people, how do you think we can possibly get community energy groups or local people to maybe de uh, uh, develop neighbourhood plans, for instance? Is that something you've looked at at all? Good question. I, I think, um, yeah, there, there have been, because there there have been forums within the local area where they've got a neighbourhood planning group and, and they've been engaged in the process. And, and there have been times where we've been invited to those, or we've gone in and spoken at those particular events. So there's definitely uh, links there. I think there could be more more links. I think a lot of community groups are, as, as we all know, quite volunteer led. So it's kind of difficult in terms of where the focus is and where the skills are, but uh, in terms of the interests of the volunteers. Uh, so there, there is potential for, for more interaction on the, on the planning side. But I think this is where the collaboration is so important. So while a, the community energy group might not have the time and opportunity to do that, we found very a lot of local other active groups who got feedback from us and then done that input directly themselves, you know. So there's there's that kind of real network of communities that are participating. Okay, I mean, uh, a question again, I can see in the chat column to uh, Tanuj, uh, from Tanuja. So can I ask this for Nadia first, then Toby and Afshin. Tanuja asks, will the GLA consider moving beyond feasibility uh, to building sustainable community enterprising, so potentially funding core roles. Nadi, you referenced this as well in the chat column. How important would it be for Celsi to provide funding for actually putting people in that community group funding them? Nadi, do you mind going first and then Toby, then Afshin? Yeah, sure. Yeah. It's a good question. Um, as Afshin highlighted, I personally as well have seen a huge number of people interested in volunteering, especially during coronavirus and pretty much over the past year. I've had an influx of people messaging me on LinkedIn, through our email saying they really want to volunteer and get involved and they want to give their time. But the problem is I don't have time to manage all of these volunteers. Our CEO is dealing with issues that are day-to-day -day issues. She's really having to deal with the minutia of uh, getting projects um, sorted and getting them off the ground, which as a CEO, she shouldn't have to be dealing with. She should be able to look at the whole picture and take that forwards. So I fully agree that it's a really big problem that um, we don't have people that are in core roles and we don't have funding for those core roles. It's actually quite hard to get funding for roles, but it's easy to get funding for capital uh, equipment. Toby, same question to you if you're there. Oh, 
Oh. Sorry, just unmuting. Yeah, I think probably the same answer, really. Um, even having won this funding this year with, 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 with NextGen, really what that's done is made us just focus on NextGen because we don't have the time or the capacity or the income to pay people to develop other ideas. So you kind of get stuck in one channel because of that. So we are looking at ways, and we're writing a couple of proposals at the moment, how we can move to that next phase. We can have people working two, three days a week outside of constantly having to generate money, that you know, time to think and develop projects and develop ideas. Otherwise, you know, our model until now has been, let's find the grant, let's develop the project, let's find another grant, develop the project, and you're in that constant treadmill of yeah. just trying to stay above water. Uh, and it would be great if there was some kind of funding that says, okay, that person for two days a week for the next year is covered, and they can just do something creative with it. It seems to me that with climate emergency plans and local authorities having real challenges in terms of having offices, uh, mm -hmm. volunteer potential, community energy potential is massively untapped. I can see in the chat column a very helpful intervention from Patrick Althorn. Uh, welcome, Patrick, from Bayes, who's mentioned that uh, Bayes has recently invested in Community Energy England. Since we have the chair of Community Energy England, Afshin, can you just talk about uh, that and maybe anything else in terms of how we can access funding for community groups from government or otherwise. And Mark, do you, are you aware of any funding structures in terms of how to actually strengthen community energy groups? Ashin first. Okay, um, I just wanted to uh, answer the first question around the funding and the GLA support. And I think, uh, yes, it goes without saying that core, you know, covering our core costs is essential rather than being driven by project, uh, just project costs. Uh, but here is there's a, you know, the GLA could have leveraging powers to encourage uh, a wider portfolio of of, uh, of funders or trust funds or organizations um, to to kind of uh, help support and, and fund those, the core proposition. At the moment, I think all of us are going to the same same funders, be it power to change and it's highly competitive, you know, and we, we've got the energy redress or you've got, uh, and Patrick, I think, is, is referring to the, um, is it the local energy partnerships and the funds that are being channeled um, through through their plans um, and through the hubs um, to ensure that, you know, there is a, a work program for community energy. But again, uh, I, while we're in the London context, that is very much a rural context and we, we still are missing out on uh, on the city uh, funds and city community energy groups. And it, again, I think those funds are very much um, project driven as well. So it isn't it isn't about the core where the gap is uh, and where essentially you can do a bit more around the strategy. So uh, I uh, I mean, I think for me, it's more about if, if there's something the GLA can take away, really, it's about kind of inviting and encouraging other funders to also um, open uh, their funding uh, streams to community energy, but not just on a project basis or a capital yeah. basis, but really, and I, I think the bit that, that is really, really challenging and people cannot underestimate the amount of work that goes in in managing volunteers or that goes in in reaching out to communities that are hard to reach. You know, there's a reason why they are hard to reach because people aren't doing it the right way. They're, you know, they're cost savings. That's why. Uh, it, it's you know it's just kind of recognizing the value that is being provided and 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 how we can make these more sustainable models moving forward. So I think uh, to me that leveraging power will be quite critical for the GLA. And my final point really is you mentioned about local authorities and you're right that local authorities are under resourced and um, need support, but they're absolutely critical in enabling us to make these projects happen. And North Kensington Community Energy wouldn't have been possible if we didn't have Anka, who's a climate uh, change team uh, uh, lead in, in the council. And how can we then have, I think there should be a Community Energy London officer supporting, you know, in a supporting role within all local authorities so that we can see more of this happen. So again, how can the GLA enable that to happen where local authorities are actually ring fencing or have the finance to be able to fund those really essential roles? Because that partnership and collaboration, we could achieve loads. Excellent points. Mark, you're on mute. If you could go ahead and uh, give uh, any thoughts you have, especially because we weren't only talking about in your particular part about funding projects, but funding organisations to actually develop projects. I, I'm going to try and answer, but I might not answer quite the question you're, you posed. I think if, if you look 
I worked for 30 years inside local government. Now I'm outside. And you've got planners, you've got procurement, you've got legal, you've got finance, you've got asset management, you've got housing, you've got schools, you've got all sorts of different organisations, most of whom don't talk to each other within the council. And that's just incredibly hard. And there are one or two bottlenecks that really block community energy schemes. So firstly, I think I would be saying, how do we make this happen? And plea to local government is bring these organisations together, make it clear there's a climate emergency and that we don't have to have the legal team, the mid-level legal officer redesigning a form for the, you know, for the umpteenth time for the agreement with the local community energy group. And crucially, because I think it's the thing Rescoop talks about, we need a bike lane, a separate lane alongside the main energy lane for community energy. And I think one of the areas that often blocks it is procurement. The procurement assessment process within the finance teams where, you know, you end up having this very mechanistic approach where it says, have you got three years of accounts and a parent company guarantee and blah, blah, blah. And it knocks so many different community energy groups out. So having a serious think about how you simply say this is not a high risk area. We don't need these processes at its point so we could have a more flexible approach for key parts of the procurement process, which will allow community energy groups to come through. That would be my suggestion. Thank you. Uh, Kerry's uh, quite rightly reminded me there's a couple of questions which I've missed in the chat column. Can I ask, uh, we have a four in particular, they, their questions may or may not have been answered and I'm mindful of time as well. I think uh, we can probably go for another few minutes before we start uh, uh, testing our uh, attendees' patients. But Phyllis, uh, did you still have a question that you wanted to ask the panel? Um, no, it's, 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 can you hear me? I can indeed. You can. It's it's a bit late because that that group has now has now closed. Do you know of any other uh, local? It's called Ecolution. Do you know of any other groups that are getting together for for solar panels on Camden houses? On Camden houses. Yes. Uh, uh, can we? I think what can we? Would you mind uh, emailing me on syed at energyforlondon dot org? That's s y e d at energyforlondon.org, and I'll get back to you on that, Phyllis. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Allcorn, was that you, you or Patrick there wanted to raise anything? Uh, you, there was um, just about to say, a, bi um, a separate bicycle lane for community energy. Can you help on that? Um, well, I can give it a go. I've been asked to write a, um, a blog for the uh, Bayes Intranet on community energy fortnight, so that at least will raise um, awareness across the department. But what I was going to say was um, thank you for tonight. And if we could have the slides, that'd be really helpful because there's been some brilliant stuff there. And I think uh, the, the scaling up is the is the key to getting that separate lane and that understanding um, in government. Uh, but what I was meaning by the investment, we've we've given Community Energy England some money uh, to try and create a regional infrastructure uh, mirroring what's happened in Community Energy South and Community Energy London, but across England, uh, so that we can get um, community groups working together more effectively, aggregating more effectively in those regions, working more effectively with their local authorities, um, and also doing more peer-to-peer -peer, uh, training. So one of the conditions of the grants under, albeit a rural community energy fund, is that uh, those community groups in receipt of the uh, grant uh, provide some peer-to-peer -peer support for other community groups. Now, that part of it is not limited to other rural community groups, so it could be um, supporting community groups. Those, those rural community groups in the southeast could be supporting community groups in London and vice versa. So um, that was the point I was uh, trying to make. Thank you. Cheers, Patrick. Thank you. And if you could take back to the minister that uh, we would particularly be welcome in London if the Urban Community Energy Fund could be replaced as part of any green economic recovery package for cities, that would be very welcome. You can shove that in your blog. I, said, I meant that in the nicest way. Uh, David, forgive me, David, I'm not sure which David, and I'm not quite sure of your question, but if there was a David there who wanted to raise something, 
now's your time? Uh, yeah, it's David Saunders down in Bristol with Lockley's Love Solar. Uh, and it was really on the point of district heating and wondering uh, uh, some of the commentators on renewable energy, like Chris Goodall in his book, What Do We, what do we Need to Do Now, uh, are saying we, we, we need lots more wind, we need lots more solar, and then hydrogen for storage. One of the problems with district heating, creating high demand in winter, and solar creating high generation in the summer is that unless you've got a storage system, uh, you're going to have an unbalanced grid and hydrogen gives you long term storage as well as a methane replacement in the gas grid. Just a thought. Uh, uh, thank you. I, I, if you forgive me, I, I won't open that uh, further. You're right. The biggest storage element we have in the UK energy system is, in fact, the gas grid. And uh, there was a report out today. Again, there seems to be a report out virtually every week about the potential of hydrogen. And uh, it was actually also very welcome to see the Committee on Climate Change produce their annual progress report this week, which I'm sure Patrick would have looked through. Uh, five or six years ago, they would barely mention district heating. Today, district heating was quite strongly mentioned there. Uh, finally, Paul, uh, I, again, forgive me, I, I don't know your question, Paul, if it's been answered, but if a, a Paul could flag themselves up. Perhaps Paul's answer question has been answered, or more properly, he's felt I've gone way past my time. So uh, I should, oh, but is that you, Paul Hallis? Yeah, I don't, I don't think it was me that the the, the okay. last question. <laughs> if I did, it was an accident. <laughs> That's fine, not to worry. But uh, you know, I think we, it's been a really useful discussion. But I, I suspect I shouldn't sort of prolong the proceedings unnecessarily at this point. Cheers, Paul. Glenn, I can see your face. Is that you're just turning on your camera, or did you have a particular question in mind at all? I see a nod. Okay. I think if you don't mind all we'll bring proceedings for the evening to a close. I'd just like to thank our four speakers, Toby, Afshin, Nadia, and Mark. I'd like to thank all our participants, all the people who put a range of quite mind boggling range of questions on energy in the chat column. So everything from hydrogen buses, um, sorry, uh, electric buses, hydrogen, heat pumps, and uh, much, much more. Uh, I think that's uh, very important. Uh, please do note Duncan Law's request about the virtual lobby that will take place with MPs on Tuesday the 30th of June. More information on that on the Community Energy England website. Uh, the slides will be made available, so please do uh, send them. Patrick will make sure you get them. We'll also make them available on the Community Energy London website, communityenergy.london. If there are any local authority officers still on, just to say Community Energy London published a guidance note on how to set up a community energy fund in a local authority 10 days ago, also on our website, Community Energy London. I will shut up and I'll give the last word to our host at the GLA, Sylvia Barron. Sylvia, if you could wrap up in the last minute, that would be great. Over to you. Thank you, Said. Um, just as a thank you to the very great speakers we had tonight and everyone who attended for uh, sticking with us uh, for, for, for that long, but it was so interesting. Um, we got a lot here uh, for us to think about, some really great ideas and, and thoughts. Um, the Jamboard will remain sort of open for a few days, so don't hesitate to uh, put more questions or ideas into the Jamboard. The link is just here in the chat. And I wanted to just finish with a, a little video as well that I, I leave you to watch in your own time. It's only a two minutes video from our Deputy Mayor Shirley Rodriguez that she did for Community Energy Fortnight in support of all of you and to thank, I think, all the community groups for all your amazing work uh, and especially during COVID as well for deploying, uh, you know, additional resources and volunteers to help uh, vulnerable people during this crisis. So a big thank you to everyone. And if you put slides in the chat, uh, box just just type slides um, we will make sure we email you a copy of the slides as well and uh, we'll um, make the recording available too thank you very much everyone thank you all have a good evening and stay safe bye bye there thank you everyone bye bye